Today on America's Test Kitchen, Julia and Bridget reveal a classic recipe for paella on the grill. Adam reviews paella pans with Bridget, and Dan makes Julia an authentic Spanish version of patatas bravas. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. There are few better dishes than paella. It's got seafood, sausage, spices, lots of aromatics, all cooked with broth and wine in a wide shallow pan that's made just for the job. Most modern recipes are cooked indoor, but what most people don't know is that paella was originally made on the grill. That's right. And that grill gives the dish a subtle smokiness and creates the ultra crisp rice crust that I love. It's called saccharat. Yes, and we'll get there, Bridget. <laughs> but the real key to paella is in the broth because that's what infuses the rice with flavor. So we're gonna make a broth really quickly before we head out to the grill. Sounds great. And here I have a tablespoon of olive oil heating up in a medium saucepan over medium heat. And to this, we're gonna add, don't laugh, five and a half cloves of garlic. Do they make half cloves of garlic, <laughs> Julia? No, they don't. What I've done is I've reserved that last half a clove, and we're going to use it to flavor oh, the shrimp. Okay, okay, great. So we're going to cook this for about a minute until it starts to stick a little bit to the bottom of the pan and turn a little golden. That takes about a minute. So the real flavor to any paella is the sofrito, which is a combination of onions, bell peppers, and tomatoes. But when you're cooking that out on the grill, it takes much too long to drive off that moisture and begin to caramelize. So we're going to swap out those wet tomatoes for some tomato paste because it's already cooked down and it will deliver that hearty tomato flavor. Here I have three tablespoons of tomato paste. And along with that, we're going to add mm, some hot smoky Ooh, paprika. That smells so good. Yeah, doesn't it? So it's going to add that little kick of spice and of course that smoky flavor is going to come through in the paella. It's been about a minute and you can start to smell that sure spice. Mm, good, now we're going to add four cups of chicken broth. We're going to use one bottle of our favorite clam juice. To this, we're gonna add a little sherry. Oh, I love the smell of sherry. Mm -hmm. it's sort of sweet and fragrant. So this is two thirds of a cup of dry sherry. And last but not least, an optional ingredient that I'm opting in. It's the most expensive spice in the world. It's saffron. And of course, we have a lot of flavor going on here, so you don't need to add it. But I like its minerally fragrant flavor, so in it goes. That's just a nice hearty pinch. I'm just breaking up a little with my fingers before I add it in to help release its flavor. All right, so you can see this broth has come up to a good boil. So we're gonna set that aside off the heat. Now we're gonna focus on everything else that goes into paella. What I have here is a pound and a half of chicken thighs. And the chicken thighs work better than breasts because they can withstand the long cooking time on the grill without drying out. Now I trimmed these of fat and I cut them in half so they're a little bit more easy to maneuver on the grill. And we're just gonna season them with a little salt and pepper. And this is a teaspoon of salt and a teaspoon of pepper. And that looks like kosher salt. That is kosher salt. I'll flip these guys over. And that's it. These guys are ready for the grill. All right, next up, the shrimp. Now these are the big guys, the jumbos. And of course, we're gonna wanna peel and devein them. So to peel it, I just like to pull off the peel. And I start at the tail and work my way forward. And I'm gonna leave the tail on because I think it looks kind of cool. I don't like them when they're so naked all the time when you pull that tail off. Of course, you wanna cut right down the center of the top of the shrimp and you wanna look to see if there's that little vein because that vein can taste kind of gross. And so I just like to take the tip of a paring knife and cut it off. That's 12 ounces of shrimp. And of course, I'm gonna season it before it goes on the grill. And this is a tablespoon of olive oil. And here's that half clove of garlic that I saved a little more hot smoked paprika. This is a quarter of a teaspoon. Last but not least, a little salt. That's a quarter of a teaspoon. We're just gonna toss this together. This just gives that shrimp a little bit of extra flavor before you add it to the paella. And mm, that looks good. Okay, those are ready for the grill. We're also gonna add some chorizo. Now this is a pound of chorizo, and it's the Spanish chorizo. So it's pre-cooked, and it's spicy, and it's gonna add good flavor. We're also gonna add some clams. Now these are little necks. We're gonna add a pound of these, and all you gotta do is rinse them off and give them a good scrub to make sure there's no sand hidden on the shells. And last but not least, we have a boreal rice, which is from Italy, not <laughs> Spain, which is where Paella is from. I like that, the Gina Lola Brigida mm, of, of rice, right? Yes, Italy. <laughs> but real paella uses a medium grain rice, and this is a medium grain rice that you can easily find in the supermarket because it's used to make risotto. 
But the original rice for paella is either bomba or Valencia. And if you can find these guys, have at it. They taste amazing, but they can be hard to find in the supermarkets. And a boreo rice is a great stand-in. All right. Well, who knew? The Italians make great paella. Mm. All right, so I've been heating up this grill for about five minutes. And you can see it's getting good and hot. Now that was a full chimney of charcoal. And on top of that, I scattered about 20 extra briquettes that will help maintain a really hot fire for a long time. Sounds good. So before we get cooking, I'm gonna clean and oil the grill. Of course, this grill looks pretty clean. I'm gonna give it a quick scrub down. As always, before you grill, we're gonna wipe that grill grate down with a little bit of vegetable oil. Now, before we start building the paella, I'm gonna grill the chicken quickly. That helps get the cooking started, but it also gives it some nice grill flavor. So I'm not gonna grill this chicken through completely. We're just gonna get some good grill marks and flavor on both sides, then it takes about five minutes. All right, so this chicken is lightly browned on both sides, which is just what we're looking for. And like you said, we're not done cooking it, though. No, so I'm putting it back on the plate it was on, which was the raw chicken, which generally would be a no-no when you're grilling, but it's gonna go back into the paella to cook fully, so it's okay to reuse this plate. All right, so we're gonna set this chicken aside, and now it's time to get cooking. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this nice 15-inch paella plate right on the grill. And I'm gonna heat up a quarter cup of oil, and much like you're cooking inside, you wanna heat up the oil till it's shimmering before we add the vegetables. Sounds great. All right, so that oil is now shimmering, so it's time to add our vegetables. There's one onion, and here is half a cup of roasted red peppers. And you remember we talked inside about the Spanish sofrito, which has bell peppers, but bell peppers take a long time to cook, so I'm using roasted red peppers instead. Last but not least, a little salt. This is half a teaspoon of salt. And just as if you were sauteing inside on the stovetop, we're doing the same thing, but just outside here on the grill. And we're gonna cook these for about five minutes till the onions get nice and softened. So what do you do if you don't have a paella pan? Not to worry, as long as you have a large roasting pan like this. This is also stove top safe, meaning it can go on the grill. Now the idea here is that we're providing a very large cooking surface. What does that mean? Well, all that rice that's eventually going to go in the bottom of our paella is gonna have plenty of opportunity to develop into a deep, dark crust. So remember, if you don't have a paella pan, roasting pan will do the job. All right, so those onions have wilted down, they're softened, and they're starting to caramelize. So it's time to add the rice. And again, this is three cups of arboreal rice. We're going to stir it around so it gets well coated by that oil. That'll help make that sock rot, but it'll also help keep the rice from getting too sticky. And we're going to put the chicken around the edge of the dish because the edge of this dish cooks a little more coolly. And so we don't want the chicken to overcook and turn dry, so it'll simmer around the edge. All right, the chicken's in place. Time to add the broth. Mm. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So I'm just gonna slowly pour this around. I just got the best hint of saffron as soon as Julia oh. took that lid right off the pot. Doesn't that smell good? Amazing. Now I'm just gonna go back in, make sure the chicken is still around the edge. I'm also looking to make sure all the rice is submerged in the liquid, that there's none stuck on the edges of the pan or on top of the chicken. And then she looks good. Now we're just gonna let this liquid come up to a full simmer before we add the rest of the ingredients. All right, that's come up to a solid simmer, and it's time to add the rest of our ingredients, starting with the shrimp. We're just gonna put the shrimp right in the middle of the pan. It's like a paella pinwheel. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Next, we're gonna add the clams, and I'm gonna put the clams in hinge side down so that when they pop open, they'll have plenty of room. Last but not least, we're gonna add a pound of chorizo that we've cut up into chunks. Now, when's it going to be in my belly? That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, about 15 minutes more on the grill. Every so often, I'm going to give that paella pan a spin so that the crust on the bottom that you love so much is a nice, even golden brown. Mmm, that's looking good. It's looking great. The rice is almost tender, and it's time to add the last ingredient, the peas. Now, this is a cup of frozen peas that are thawed. I'm just going to sprinkle them over the top of the paella. Of course, if we added these too soon, they'd be army green by the end. So just <laughs> at the end is perfect. Now we're gonna put the lid on, and now we're gonna start to make that crust happen. Yes. Mm. So we're gonna put the lid on for about five minutes, and that's gonna evaporate the rest of that moisture, and you're gonna hear the rice start to sizzle. When you hear that sizzle, take the lid off, let it go for about 15 minutes longer, checking the crust. All right, so this paella has been cooking uncovered on the grill for about 15 minutes. I've been giving it a good spin every once in a while to make sure that sakurat is nice and evenly golden. Julia, that is the most spectacular thing I've ever seen come off a grill. I know, isn't it so impressive? It's beautiful. The one way to check the crust on the edge is just to dig in there a little bit. You see how it's oh. coming. Oh, and you can see 
those nice dark bits on the bottom. Oh yeah. I'm not gonna disturb the whole crust. I'm gonna leave that in place. I'm gonna take the paella pan off the grill. And of course, I'm gonna cover it with foil to help keep it hot. All right, so this paella has been resting for about 10 minutes. And I've been hungry for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> She's a beauty. Let me dig in here and get not only some of that good rice, but let me make sure I scrape up some of that amazing sukkarat. And that is the whole reason to do it on the grill, because if you make paella in the oven, you're never gonna get this. It's only on the grill that you can get such a good sukkarat. All right. Lemon? Yes, just a little bit. Look at that. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. And the flavor of the rice is just so deep and complex. It's spicy, a little bit tangy. That is perfect. Mm -hmm. As it turns out, you don't need to head to Spain for amazing paella because your backyard grill is made for this recipe. Once you make a savory broth, cook everything evenly by placing the chicken thighs around the rim of the pan and then put the shellfish in the center. Top the dish with peas and chorizo and don't forget that real prize, the golden crust of savory rice. So there you have it, from our test kitchen to your kitchen, a mas excelente paella <laughs> on the grill. Muy bueno. Mm-hmm. Sure, you can make a really good paella in a large skillet or even a roasting pan. So is it worth it to buy a paella pan, which is built just for that job? Well, Adam is here to let us know. It all depends on authenticity, Bridget. <laughs> if you want a nice, authentic grilled paella, it's really worth having a paella pan. We had five pans in our lineup, and the price range was $24.95 to $79. Now, this one is made of stainless steel. All the other four are made of carbon steel. This one is enameled carbon steel so that you don't really have to treat it specially. You can just wash it off and go. These three are raw carbon steel and those have gotta be seasoned, just like a cast mm -hmm. iron pan before you use it. I do notice four of these have dimples in them. These four and this does not. Well, the dimples are there for moisture distribution. And should I give you the big reveal? Yes. Didn't make any difference in our cooking. <laughs> okay. We did not notice any difference. What we did is we made our traditional grilled paella. We did it on both charcoal grill and a gas grill. And the good news is that all of these pans pretty much delivered. Now, you also know that the recipe takes some fiddling around. You have to rotate the pan. You have to move it around on the fire just to make sure that the heat is even. Some of these pans required more fiddling, others less. The one right in front of us required the least fiddling of all and gave us the most beautiful sukkara of all. And that's because it's heavy. Pick that thing up. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> it's 7.4 pounds, which was far and away the heaviest pan. That's because the metal from which it's made is the thickest of all the metal of these pans. This is three millimeters thick. And you know, more metal absorbs more heat, distributes it more evenly, and cooks more evenly. Another thing that our testers really liked about this pan were the handles. You can see that they're the only ones that stick up. And that just made it easier to turn when we did have to turn. It also kept testers' hands a little further away from the flames. Much safer. Much safer. In the end, this was our winning paella pan. This is the Matfer Borjat Black Steel Paella Pan. It's $49.98. It gave us a gorgeous, authentic-looking paella. The rice was uniformly cooked. The sakura was perfect and generous. You know, it's a single-use pan, but if you're a paella aficionado, it's less than 50 bucks. It's pretty much worth it, isn't it? So if you make paella on the grill, well, you can use a lot of different pans, but why not use a paella pan? And while any of these will give you great paella, our favorite was the Montfair Bourgeat Black Steel Paella Pan at $49.98. When I first met my husband, Ian, he asked me what my favorite ingredient was, and I immediately said, potatoes. Now, he laughed and thought I was kidding, but that was the truth. Potatoes are one of my all-time favorite foods. So when I tried this recipe for Spanish-style potatoes, my mind was blown. These are some of the best potatoes I've ever had. So patatas bravas is probably the most popular tapas dish, right? You go to any tapas restaurant, they're gonna have them. And the reason is, they're really, really good fried potatoes. Mm -hmm. And who doesn't like that, right? It's very good. 
So I'm gonna start with the potatoes. This is a russet potato. Uh -huh. It's the perfect one for this recipe. They're very high in starch and they're very dry, so they cook up really fluffy inside. We're using two and a quarter pounds of russet potatoes. They're normally double fried. It accomplishes two things. On the first low fry, you get basically the potatoes cooked through really gently. Mm -hmm, that makes sense. Then you take them out and you increase the temperature of the oil so you get really nice browning on the second fry. We wanted to mimic that in some ways, and we're using a really different technique. So this is eight cups of boiling water, and we're gonna add to it half a teaspoon of baking soda, which is a bit of an odd ingredient yeah. to throw into boiling water, but it serves a really good function. Okay, so now I'm gonna add the baking soda. Foams up a little bit. Oh, look at that. <laughs> and then I'm gonna add my potatoes right in. So that's a lot of potatoes for this much water. Yeah, I was gonna say. The temperature's gonna drop a little bit. It takes a little while for it to come back up, but once we're at a boil, we wanna go for a minute. And that's minute. just enough to get that outside kind of mushy. So let's talk about why we boil the potatoes with a little baking soda for just one minute. The baking soda, with its high pH, breaks down the pectin, causing the cells to leak and release starch, but only on the exterior of the potatoes because of the short cooking time. This starchy layer on the outside of the potatoes is what eventually turns into that golden crisp crust that patatas bravas are known for. All right, so Julia, this has been about a minute of boiling, so right. we just got that exterior done. So I'm gonna turn it off and it's time to drain. So I'm gonna put the potatoes back in the pot on the burner. And what we wanna do is dry them out a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know if you have a wet food and you try to fry it, it doesn't brown very rapidly. So this step, I have them over low heat for just 30 seconds, a little bit of stirring, and we'll drive off that excess moisture. Okay, so now that the potatoes are off the heat, I'm gonna add the salt. I have one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt. Obviously, it's gonna season them, but mm -hmm. it's also gonna act as an abrasive. So the salt's almost acting like a little bit of a sandpaper, roughing up the exterior of the potatoes. All right, so that's about 30 seconds there. You can see they're nice and pasty. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna turn off the heat, and we're gonna transfer them to this baking sheet here. So you can see a lot of steam coming off. Yeah. So we're gonna get lots of evaporation. They're gonna dry even more, so they fry better down the line. We can let them sit here for up to two hours and cool. So those potatoes have been cooling. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to shift over and make the sauce. Ooh. And my other favorite thing about Patatas Bravas is there's actually two sauces classically with it. A spicy tomato sauce, and that's actually where the name Patatas Bravas comes from. Bravas meaning fierce or angry, so it's a spicy tomato sauce. Mm. And the other one is an alioli, which is not totally unsimilar to a mayonnaise, but it has a garlic paste as the emulsifier. So oh, okay. you just mix in oil. It's a little bit of a tough thing to make, so we're actually gonna go with store-bought mayonnaise. We're gonna use garlic paste, because we want this sauce to be really smooth. Mm -hmm. And a quick way to do that is actually using a microplane yes. like this, a rasp grater. So I grab it with the stem end here, because I'm mm -hmm. gonna kind of leave that on there at the end. Then I simply just run it down the microplane. No, I love this trick. I do it all the time at home. And I also use it for ginger. All right, so that's great. I have a tablespoon of vegetable oil. I'm gonna put this over medium low heat. Then I'm gonna put the garlic in next. So I've also got a teaspoon of sweet smoked paprika. It's a really important flavor in a lot of Spanish cooking. I also have a half teaspoon of kosher salt. And then here's the cayenne. So this is where the bravas comes in, the spiciness. I'm gonna step back. <laughs> That's <laughs> so a lot of cayenne. It is, so you can do a half to three quarters of a teaspoon. We're gonna go crazy, we're gonna go three quarters. All in. All in, right? So we're gonna just cook this for about 30 seconds here, just to kind of bloom the spices. Oh, you can really smell it. Yeah. Oh, that smells good. Okay, so 30 seconds, that's nice and aromatic. Mm -hmm. We're good. Our next ingredient is tomato paste. Uh -huh. So we want it to be really smooth. Mm -hmm. It's not chunky. You don't want a chunky tomato product. Tomato paste is really concentrated, add a lot of flavor. All right, I'll stir that in. And another 30 seconds here, kind of bloom that Ooh. flavor as well. All right, that's great. Next up, I have a half cup of water. Mm -hmm. That's gonna thin it out, create our sauce, and just whisk it in. Helps to kind of break up the tomato paste, which can be kind of thick. Okay, so I'm gonna bring this up to a boil over high heat, which is gonna happen real fast because we've already got the heat on there. Okay, so now it's up to a boil. I'm mm -hmm. gonna bring it down to medium low and cook for about four to five minutes and really thicken it up. Okay, so it's been four minutes. Mm -hmm. It's getting nice and thick, nice and concentrated, so that's perfect. All right, so I'm gonna transfer this to this big bowl over here. My final ingredient for this sauce is two teaspoons of sherry vinegar, which is a really nice vinegar, tons of flavor. So whisk that in. We're gonna let this cool completely, and then we're gonna finish the sauce up, and then it's time to fry the potatoes. Julie, it's time to fry. All right. Are you excited? I love frying. I do too, yeah, and this is gonna be great. So we've got three cups of vegetable oil, mm -hmm. and this is at 375 degrees. We're gonna add the potatoes all at once. So just bring my pan over, get it nice and low in there, and drop them in. We want it to go down on oil because no one likes to fry with a ton of oil. Yep. So we tried it in one test and they came out really nice and we figured out that it's actually not unsimilar to when we do the double fry method. You start with a low temperature and then do a high temperature. 
Here, the oil drops significantly in temperature. Mm -hmm. So you get really low heat, cook them through nice and gently without too much browning. Then as the temperature climbs, they start to brown and crisp. So it's gonna take about 20 to 25 minutes. They're gonna turn nice and golden brown in that time. And we don't have to take them in and out of the pot a bunch of times. So while these are frying, we're gonna finish up our sauce over here. I've got my cold sauce, mm -hmm. and I mentioned that alioli before, which yeah. is that garlic-based mayonnaise. So what we're gonna do is actually just use store-bought mayonnaise, and I've got a quarter cup of it here. The best thing is when these two sauces kind of merge on the plate, mm. so we're basically just doing that ahead of time. <laughs> we're cheating, you know? I'm all for cheating. Okay, as long as it tastes good, right? Yep. Oh, that would be good on sandwiches. In my head right now, I'm thinking of all the things I could slather this sauce on, and there's a lot. It is a lot, so if this goes missing in a minute, I'll know. <laughs> Okay, so about 25 minutes, and mm -hmm. you can take a look and see they're beautiful golden brown, nice and crispy. Those look gorgeous. They look good, right? You can hear them too, how crunchy they are against the spider there. So I'm going right onto paper towel. We could just go into the wire rack, but that paper towel is gonna help absorb more of the oil. And when they're coming out is really the time when a lot of that oil gets sucked back into the potato. So putting them onto paper towel makes a big difference. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, they look good, huh? They look terrific. All right, so while they're nice and hot, I'm also gonna season them with some salt. They have a little bit in the crust, so you don't need to go too heavy, but seasoning right now, nice and high up, even distribution on there. Salt's gonna stick better while they're hot. Okay, so those are ready now. They look amazing. They look good, right? Okay, so now I'm gonna serve you a few here, and I'll give you some sauce. Mmm. Swooning. Potatoes really are my all-time favorite. And because we use those russets, it's really mm -hmm. nice and fluffy inside. Mm. Yeah, there's the texture difference, the crunchy on the outside and really creamy on the inside, and it tastes like potato because we used russets. The sauce is pretty fierce, right? Oh, the sauce. <laughs> this sauce <laughs> would be good on cardboard, man. <laughs> this sauce is killer. And it's nice because it's spicy from all the cayenne, mm -hmm. but then the mayonnaise kind of mellows it out a little bit. These potatoes are the bomb. So for my new favorite potato recipe, you start by boiling the potatoes for one minute in water laced with baking soda. Then after draining, cook them in a dry pot with some salt before finally deep frying them until they're super golden and crisp. So from the test kitchen to your kitchen, a brand new recipe for patatas bravas. You can get this recipe, all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and selected episodes on our website at americastestkitchen.com. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.